So we just got the fifth episode of Star Trek Discovery, and in it, we got a new main cast member. We got the new Harry Mudd, played by Rain Wilson, and to my knowledge, I think we got the first two F-bombs in Star Trek history. So let's talk about it. Hey guys, Sean Chandler here. If you've checked out my previous reviews of Star Trek Discovery, you know my sister has joined me. She couldn't make it this week. She should be back next week, so I'll be reviewing this episode all by myself. My general impression of this week, I think this is probably the episode I've enjoyed the most and could just settle in with what the show is and watch it on its own merits and not kind of be frustrated by differences or newness of I, the show or not knowing what to expect. This one, I had the best idea of what the show is, what I'm going into, so I could just watch and enjoy the episode and the story that it told me for what it was. So before I start talking about the episode and breaking down the plot and the good and the bad, be sure to put your thoughts down below in the comment section. I'd love to have a lively discussion going, but can we keep it friendly this week? Last week it got pretty nasty and there was some just really mean-spirited stuff said in the comment section. I don't want the comment section to go that way. I'm going to start deleting comments and banning people if you keep that up. So friendly discussion. We can disagree and we can be friendly and have a fun discussion, not a mean-spirited discussion. Now let's talk about Star Trek. So to summarize the plot of this week's episode, Lorca is ordered to start using the spore drive less because the Starfleet is afraid that the Klingons are going to start to figure out what the secret weapon is. Shortly afterwards, Lorca is kidnapped by the Klingons. He puts put in a cell with the brand new Harry Mudd, played by Rain Wilson. Along also in the cell, they meet our new cast member Ash Tyler, who's been held captive for quite a while. And so because of this, the second in command of the ship, the Scaredy Cat, is put in charge of the Discovery. And he's very nervous about this, so he starts researching great captains of the past. And so you get a couple Easter eggs in there of Archer and Pike on the screen that he's trying to research some of the, the people. And he commands Michael and the crew of science people to research our spore drive to make it more efficient to get in there, even though they're very nervous about using it the way that he wants to use it. So they're not crazy about all this. So they're trying to come up with a way to not hurt our creature that they can't seem to convince anyone is sentient and has feelings and is intelligent, um, even though it's very obvious that it does. Um, and so they're trying to find an alternative method to doing all this. So then in our third act, Lorca manages to escape with Ash Tyler, leaves Harry Mudd behind while flying out on a Klingon starfighter type ship. Uh, the Discovery was able to spore jump in. The creature swells up all upset about everything that's happening, but because of the research type stuff that they did, uh, once the captain is beamed on board the ship, they're able to spore jump out of there and they discovered that our science guy experimented with himself with the technology they were trying to figure out to be able to save the creature. So they are, are able to jump using a human instead of the creature thing, the Ripper. And then in the end of it, um, Michael frees the Ripper into space, I guess, and it kind of jumps off trying to make it healthy again at the with the second command ordering her to do so. And the implication of, I guess, the final scene of it is that maybe something funky is going on with our science guy that experimented on himself. So there's the episode. And I thought it just kind of it was a little bit more clear in its structure and its goal than most of the previous episodes, as well as I was typically the episodes that have been Klingon focused in doing all the Klingon dialogue stuff that hasn't worked for me at all in the previous episodes. And just so you know, if for some reason or not for some reason, if you're checking into one of my reviews for the first time, I have a lot of serious issues with this show. I'm not going to rehash all of that again here. I'm going to try and just talk about this episode in and of itself. If you want to know my issues with the show, click up here. There's a link to a video I put out about five days ago with my five big issues with the show. Kind of really spell out why I have some issues with calling this show Star Trek and how it doesn't have the heart of Star Trek. Now let's dive into this episode and talk about the good. Right off the bat, like I've mentioned up to this point in time, this one just seemed to have a much clearer focus in what was everyone's objective and they're trying to accomplish. So Captain Lorca is kidnapped. He wants to survive and he wants to escape. Our number two guy, who's now captain, wants to lead the ship well, be a good captain. He's not quite sure how to do that, but his goal is clear. Rescue that guy, whatever it takes, because that's what he's taught me is do whatever it takes. And so he starts mimicking what he's seen Lorca do, and that involves not caring so much about this creature. And then along the same lines, our 
science tea people working with the Ripper, they want the creature to live and they want to save the captain, so they're trying to find a new solution. So it's all very clear objectives, all very clear where the tension is inside of all of this and the actual drama, as opposed to just so much kind of stuff going on that you don't know who to root for. In this situation, you know, we all want the same thing, Lorca to come back alive, and we don't want, or most of us have the same goal, we don't want to kill this creature. And so it's all very clear in what, who we're rooting for in the direction that we're all headed in the episode. So that makes for good story time. It's also nice that very, which was, if they hadn't gone in this direction, I'd be very nervous, but immediately in this episode, right up front, we're talking about this creature seems to be intelligent. It's, we're hurting it. This is not okay. And so the actual ethical dilemma of we need this creature to do serve a purpose for us to win this war because we lots of millions, billions of people will die if we lose the war, but there's a creature that we're torturing. Like that actual ethical tension, that's Star trek -y. That's a good direction to go. That's where they went with it, and that's kind of where the plot played out throughout this episode of people being like, "We, I know we want to save the captain, but we can't do this to this creature. And they're like, well, people die if we don't save the captain. That's legitimate ethical dilemma type stuff that I want to see in my Star Trek. Other good things in this episode, we get more of Lorca's backstory and continues to paint him as this I would win at any cost and a pretty brutal guy and not a guy that you necessarily, you like him in a certain sense because you like the actor and he's able to pull uh, certain things and make him charming. But then the more you learn about him, the more it's like, ooh, this is this guy's a rough guy in some of the choices that he's made. Finally, it's great to see Rain Wilson in here. I'm a big fan of The Office. It's like my wife and I's favorite show to watch together. And so just seeing him in here is always fun. I don't have big, strong connections to Harry Mudd. So, you know, differences don't necessarily pop out too much to me. Um, and like Rain Wilson was in Galaxy Quest. So it's nice to see some of these, even some of those little connections. I don't know if that was anything to do with their casting. I know it's a nice little Easter egg for me personally, you know, that he's got connections to Galaxy Quest in the past. So that one for me was just a, a, a little bit of fun casting that they got him in this. Now moving on to the bad, and really there's kind of two, two big negatives on this episode for me. And the first one is the kind of structure of the story seemed very reminiscent of the previous episode, which is to say that there's a thing over here that needs to be rescued and we need to figure out how to do the spore drive with this creature to get there and rescue it. And so in that sense, I mean, it was like, whether it's a like lithium colony that needs their mining field that needs to be saved or captain needs to be saved, what was happening on the ship was very similar with Michael debating with our science guy about how to fix this and t science stuff, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so that story structure seemed very similar when it seems like, all right, shouldn't we be doing different types of story structures, not just that thing over there must be rescued. How can we get our spore drive to get us over there? And let's debate the ethics of that. It's just familiar. It's just recycling what we did before. Now, I enjoyed it this week more than last week because it wasn't intercut with the Klingon stuff, but it was still the same basic sort of structure. Second issue I do with the episode that kind of ties to all of my bigger long form issues with the show is the unnecessary adult and it actually technically speaking rated R quality to the show. Like they're actively making the show more adult than it needs to be. In this episode, for example, where there was two things that happened, there's two F-bombs. When it comes to the MPAA and rating movies, you can put one F-word in your movie and they'll still give you a PG-13. If you put two F-words in or you put the wrong usage of the F-word in your movie, they give you an R rating. This one had two, so it would have gotten an R rating just because they could put F-bombs in it, just because it's on CBS All Access and they want to be like, see, it's like an adult Star Trek. Boom, we got F-words in there. But there's no reason to do that. It just becomes a hurdle of entry for children of certain ages, for certain people to want to watch the show. And there's a bunch of people that sat down with their families to watch this show. And then there were F-bombs in it. And they're like, ooh, that's not what we wanted to show our kids today. And that's, I just don't understand why they're doing that. I don't understand why you would want to make Star Trek less accessible to watch as families. And then also in it, uh, the plot line with the uh, Ash Tyler, the new crew member that was on the Starship or on the Klingon ship, wasn't the implication that he'd been sexually molested or sexually abused by the female or Klingon female captain? Like that was my implication of where they went with things, which seems once again like 
Did it need to go there? Is that where we needed to take this show to tell this story? Because we didn't need two F-bombs that would become a barrier for some children to be able to watch the show. And we didn't need to have um, the implication of sexual abuse in there either. So I, I just I just don't know why they're doing that. Very strange direction to take things. Um, so and pretty off putting because it ties into the narrative in my head that they just have a certain disregard for Star Trek canon, the source material and the fans and putting F-bombs in there just because you can is just such a weird thing to do. And to go back to kind of my big issues with the show in general, one of the big theories about the show is this this is a show about Section 31, and Lorca's a Section 31 captain, and that's why he's this war at any cost guy. And perhaps that's true. Perhaps that's where this is going. I wouldn't be surprised if it is where this is going. But that doesn't explain why the second-in-command scaredy-cat guy also, as people are pleading with him, this is a sentient creature. It is intelligent. It is being tortured. We're not okay with this, that he went, well, we need to save the captain at any cost. We just have to do this. It doesn't explain why he would go there, why he would behave that way. Um, and it's, well, you know, he's... Um you know, he's supposed to, he's afraid, he's just trying to be a good captain. Um, he read all these articles and so whatever, those are bad excuses. Like if this is actual Starfleet and the captain's behaving the way he is because he's section 31 and everyone else is Starfleet based on the knowledge that we have of what Starfleet meant prior to this TV show and prior to Star Trek Into Darkness, he wouldn't, he would be like these science people being like, no, we, we can't do this. It is not okay for us to kill a creature so that we can warp somewhere faster. That's not okay. Um, and so that kind of pokes some holes in the section 31 theory of things. I, that's, you know, kind of one final thought on that. Anyway, those are my thoughts on it. How about you guys? What did you think about it? Tell me down below in the comment section. Um, try to be nicer. <laughs> like, I don't care if you disagree with me. Even if you call my ideas stupid, there's some pretty nasty stuff this last week. If we could not do that, that would be pretty, that would be much nicer. I'd appreciate that. Uh, if you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, TV reviews, like the one you're watching right now. I also do ranking videos, but the big thing is I don't want to just talk about Star Trek. I want to talk about Star Trek with you, so join me in the comment section. Let's have a lively, friendly discussion, and thank you so much for watching.